Hello everyone. So um, this talk is, as um, Jordan has just said, about formal verification of quantum cryptography. I guess every one of you has heard of quantum cryptography. Um, but let me say quickly what I mean, what area I'm talking about when I say formal verification. Because the word verification is um, used in a lot of different meanings throughout the um, scientific world. So, in this case, formal verification means the verification of proof. So imagine you have a proof that you have written down by hand, a mathematical proof, and you don't trust it, and you want to have a computer verify the proof. So that kind of verification we are talking about. We are not talking about, for example, verifiable blind quantum communication or verification of the fact that an experiment was well done. So this is just to clarify which meaning of verification I'm talking about. So let me give you, uh, so this talk will um, cover different aspects. It will be a bit of an overview of the problems in verification. It will be a bit of a um, vision talk, like what I would like to achieve. And it will be a bit of a report about what I have achieved. Since verification is, formal verification is pretty far from the methods that most people in this audience uh, use, I will not go into um, deep technical detail here, but I want to give you a flavor for the challenges that um, occur here. And I happily discuss anything in arbitrarily deep detail with you offline. So let me give you first a motivation why this topic is interesting. So we have, um, when we do security proofs, we have a mismatch between theory and practice. Because in theory, we know that once we've proven a protocol to be secure, it's secure, everything is fine. However, in practice, there are two big uh, challenges to that idea. So the first one, which we of which we have seen already ample examples in this conference, um, is the fact that a theoretically secure protocol can have a broken implementation. However, that, so that's the first threat. But this is not what I will address in this talk, because uh, other people are working on that. But there's the second problem that, in practice, when you have pro written a security proof, it may well be wrong, and no one notices. Because proofs are complex beasts, and you never know whether you've made a mistake, and your reviewer may overlook a mistake if it's a long proof, and the mistake may stay in the proof, and no one will ever know until someone attacks the crypto system by <coughs> exploiting that proof. Uh, that mistake. So, and I think this is a big problem because our proofs are getting more and more complicated and we can't really know just because it appears in a nice journal that the result is correct. And who wants to read a 40-page security proof? Yeah. Not even the author. <laughs> so, and this is where a verification comes in. So you would like to have proofs that can be verified using a computer. Ideally, the computer would write the proof, but that's usually, um, well, that's restricted to um, a small subset of the proof we can do, but at least we would like that the author or someone types in the proof in a way understandable to the computer, and the computer tells us then, oh, no mistake in the proof. Wait, wait, the proof that the program is correct. Sorry? But the proof that the program is correct. That, that's correct. correct. There we have a boot from. But we can try to make a minimal trusted core program that can be that is much easier to verify than all of the rest of crypto. Okay, so now I have this slide. What is quantum cryptography? I don't. I'm not trying to offend anyone here. It is more to uh, kind of establish what part of it I'm talking about. So, quantum cryptography in general, uh, to my understanding, is anything that involves cryptography and quantum. And then they call it quantum cryptography. And this large, largely splits up into two interacting but still somewhat different areas. Post-quantum cryptography, where we want to design, uh, design classical protocols that, however, should withstand attacks using a quantum computer, and quantum protocols where we use quantum stuff. So this is the distinction I have 
in mind when I talk about host quantum crypto and quantum protocols. So quantum protocols are protocols that make use of quantum communication, usually just that. In the in future protocols may also use quantum computers, quantum memory and so on, but that's a bit tricky to, uh, today. And they use quantum communication to do things that we cannot do otherwise. And the best known example is unconditionally secure key distribution, which has been around for a long time, but it's certainly not the only thing uh, that we can do. However, I will be in this talk more interested in post-quantum crypto, not because it's the only thing where we um, might want to verify, but because there, both it's uh, because there, I think there is there is where we should do the first steps. So, if we are looking at um, post-quantum cryptography, so we want schemes secure against future quantum attacks, there are three things that we need to work on. The first thing is we need to identify some crypto complexity assumptions. Um, that are not broken by a quantum computer. Those of you who get up early in the morning have had a tutorial on such things uh, just before this talk. So an example of such assumptions are various lattice problems um, and an, an example of an assumption that you shouldn't use is RSA. Then the second part you have to do is given a nice set of assumptions that you trust in, you build some crypto systems that are somehow related to these assumptions. Yeah? So it can be a very simple assumption and a huge crypto system. You, you could build, um, maybe you're not just talking about a signature scheme, but you're talking about a complete um, e-banking system solution or something. Um, so this can be arbitrarily complex based on simple assumptions. And then the third part, proof security. So this is often a tricky one, but the others are as well. Actually, I think this one is the nicest because you can just be driven by positive hope and delay all the uh, um, uh, disappointing steps to step three. So <laughs> who ha has to do these things? Step one is something which clearly needs people with quantum know-how and quantum techniques. Yeah, you can't ask someone who has never heard of a qubit to somehow figure out whether a lattice problem is realistic to be quantum safe or not. So there's no way around this. This block will be there because our methodology to find these things is come up with them, get a bunch of experts, put the experts on the problem, mix and see what happens. You don't get rid of the ex experts in this step. But the question is, can we do steps two and three without quantum literacy? Yeah, here it's clear we need to understand quantum. But perhaps these, I mean, we are talking about classical protocols. We are talking about classical protocols that are based on assumptions we assume are workloads in the quantum world. So why can we just take normal cryptographers who are used to a Newtonian a classical world and let them keep working as normal, except that we tell them, from now on, avoid RSA, it's from the devil. <laughs> um, and, well, this is kind of the hope, and this is also a bit the reality. I mean, there are a lot of cryptographers nowadays who, who work on lattice-based cryptography, but who are not experts in quantum things. Naturally, you can't be an expert in everything. So, the question is, is that a good idea? And here we have something that I call the quantum fallacy. The quantum fallacy can be stated, if you want to state it explicitly, would be if a protocol X, think of your e-banking platform, is proven secure in a classical world, and it is based on some assumption Y, say, from lattice hardness, and Y, the lattice hardness assumption, actually happens to be quantum secure, certified by experts, then we can conclude that X, the e banking platform, is quantum secure. It seems reasonable, yeah? We have shown X secure under some assumption Y, 
And then, why not use why, uh, well, and why actually is not just secure in a classical world, but in a quantum world, so everything is quantum nice, and why is also quantum secure. Unfortunately, this is not a true fact. So it can be that a protocol X is based, proven secure based on Y, uh, but X can be still quantum broken even though Y cannot be quantum broken. But a consequence of this fallacy, which, well, I don't know whether anyone will explicitly claim this, but people implicitly use it sometimes. And the effect is that cryptographers, not all, but some, <coughs> focus on using lattice-based schemes. Build, they build crypto system, they write papers, they notice, oh, I've used, a, I've used lattices, and they call the paper post-quantum secure, dadi dadi. And uh, then as a reviewer, you need to find, you always need to explain why that's not a good idea. But, uh, and I'm sure that many papers of this kind also go through if it happens that the reviewers um, <laughs> believe that. So we have a problem here. People are kind of cheating, not knowingly, but because, well, it's hard to be an expert in, in quantum stuff. I think everyone would agree only brilliant people can do quantum, right? <laughs> Okay, let me say a few words why the quantum fallacy is actually not true, because it's a, a, a subtle thing. Um, so look at the, at the typic, typical cryptographic proof. Not one of the kind like we show to make insecure, but one of the kind where we show if some complexity assumption holds, then a polynomial time adversary cannot do naughty stuff. So these proofs usually go along the lines. If an adversary A breaks the protocol X, then you can construct from A an adversary B that breaks assumption Y. And so your proof will contain an explicit construction from the adversary against X. It will construct explicitly tell you how to make an adversary B that breaks assumption Y. Those who have listened to Scott yesterday, uh, he talked about the uh, um, the evolving problem and how it is, the proof is built so that you can embarrass the person who thinks that he has a halting machine beside the Turing machine. Here it's the same. It's an explicit instruction of you can make a fool of the person who um, claimed that the protocol is uh, secure because you would build something that would build an assumption. But whatever, you can. And I, I, I think I get lost in that analogy. <laughs> so, the problem we have here is, if the adversary A is quantum, so let's say we have the proof along these lines, the classical one, and now the adversary A is a quantum adversary, what goes wrong? Well, it could be that this construction does not work. It may not even have sense. So it could be that step five of the construction is um, copy the state of the adversary. That's not uncommon. Uh, it's typically what is done in rewinding proofs, classically. But if the adversary is a, class, a quantum adversary, copying the state doesn't make sense. So even though the overall picture would be nice, we cannot take the same proof, so we cannot make from A the adversary B, because that would use cloning. So what Scott forget, forgot to mention yesterday is that one more possibility why nature has no cloning theorem is to embarrass cryptographers <coughs> who think classical. I'm not saying that every protocol that is classically secure and you do this fallacy is actually insecure in the quantum setting. I think in most cases this fallacy will work as a heuristic, but we will not have a security proof. Uh, and we should not fool ourselves that we have one. And it can be, in some cases, things work nice, but in some cases the quantum proofs can be much harder to do. Um, so, what's the situation so far of what I have told you? <clears throat> so, in post quantum crypto, we look at the security of classical protocol as quantum effects. It is not enough to find, hard, uh, to find quantum hard assumptions. We also need quantum proof techniques because we cannot just necessarily reuse the same proofs. And we now have a, a problem. 
we have a problem that a normal cryptographer, by normal I mean one that doesn't think in superposition, a normal, cryptograph, a normal cryptographers can actually not verify their own schemes. It might even be that they wrote a scheme and that for this scheme it is quite easy to make a quantum proof, that it's just changing a few lines in the classical proof and things go through. However, how will they know? Because they don't know what quantum mechanics does, so they can't check. Um, and it's not easy because now, imagine even they would like to check their proof. So then they say, what do I do? Okay, let's call a, uh, a quantum person. And then they, they, they call someone, and, uh, I ask, I'm a quantum person, and they say, would you like to go through our 50 page proof um, and check every step? It's totally boring because probably there will be no point where you actually need your expertise. All we need from you is to check that um, there is nothing where you are actually needed. And then I would figure, uh, what do I get from that? Well, it's probably not enough for a co-authorship, uh, but I think you will mention you in the acknowledgement. Um, so now we have two problems. One is I may be hesitant to do that because I have so much other fun things to do. Uh, and secondly, the reader still will not know whether someone has checked it well. Just because I'm in the acknowledgement doesn't make me the correct proof. Unfortunately. So, that's basically the situation that we have. And now I will tell you why I think that uh, verification can help us in this situation. It's a weird feeling that whenever I look at my clock, suddenly I get louder. <laughs> okay, so now we go away from the post-quantum crypto dilemma and look at verification. And what, how does the world of verification, which is mostly in the hands of classical people, and quantum crypto, can we combine it? Where are the intersection points? So we have these formal methods and security stuff done by people who are more experts in, in uh, logic, um, programming languages, uh, modern checkers, and things like that. And they have successfully applied their methods to security verification already for many years. And there we have two broad areas. Area one is what is called uh, symbolic models, sometimes also Dolapiao models, or, uh, well, lots of more, uh, names, but let's call it symbolic models. These are abstractions. So in the, such a model, we don't look at the implementation details of the protocol, we just say, oh, it has some encryption scheme in it that is just secure, it has some signature scheme that is just wonderfully secure, and in this ideal world, we just can show that no clever reordering of messages and replay effects and so on in our protocol will break anything. Uh, the problem here is that we are overlooking possible attacks, um, but it is a price worth paying in some situations if you have a really huge uh, system that you just can't verify by hand, because in those cases we can often do an automated analysis. So that's the pro of the symbolic model. The contra is they abstract from the actual cryptographic implementation. And the second view, or the second approach, is to actually do <coughs> computational crypto, meaning that whatever is proven or verified in your system is in one-to-one -one correspondence to what people would do in a pen and paper proof. So let's look what we can do with those approaches in quantum group. First, symbolic models. We could first look at the analysis of classical protocols in the post-quantum crypto setting using symbolic models. Or we could look at quantum uh, protocols. Does any of these make sense? Well, for classical protocols, I think there is nothing we can do. We have to do, because symbolic models abstract from, the, from how it's actually done. Uh, so it doesn't really make a difference whether we abstract from the fact that uh, it, how it's done in a quantum or a classical world. So at least I don't see any possible things we could do here, but I put it with a question mark, perhaps there is something, but I don't see it. And for quantum protocols, uh, it's totally unclear to me because uh, I wouldn't, uh, perhaps there's interesting research to be done, but I have no, no starting point. I wouldn't know how to analyze a protocol that uses quantum 
using the techniques that appear here. But I would be quite interested in seeing that. So I think more is to be gained here. So again, we have post-quantum crypto and quantum protocols that we want to look at. And when we look at post-quantum crypto, we have, even with the handwritten proofs, two, kind of, two kinds of situations. Situation one is that we have what I call classical proofs. These are proofs that are actually talking about quantum adversaries, but that are in one-to-one -one correspondence to, a, to the classical security proof. So you get the quantum proof by just work, inserting the word quantum um, in a few strategic places and checking whether everything is still fine. And we have the protocols where we have actually quantum proofs in the sense that we do need to do intricate quantum things to get the proof through. This is typically happening when, for example, we use quantum random oracles or whether we use re when we use rewinding, anything that has to do with zero knowledge, almost anything falls into this category. So, now that we get an interesting question. We, there has been research on computational crypto for classical protocols. So we have tools that verify, uh, um, verify proofs. What happens if we just explain, if the proof is any, any way kind of a classical proof, perhaps the existing tools can just be used to check it because they don't need to do any quantum. So this is the first question we should answer when thinking about uh, quantum verification. Perhaps we can actually machine verify the majority of the post-quantum crypto without having to develop anything new. Yeah? If the answer is yes, then it's nice because we don't have anything uh, to develop. If the answer is no, that is, that is nice because we have something to research. For quantum protocol and for quantum proofs, we clearly need some new techniques and new tools for the verification because um, the existing tools can't even talk about quantum things. So you can't say, oh, now I measure in the diagonal basis or something. Um, because it's not in the list of known operations. Um, I know. So now I would first like to look at this question here. Can we use existing tools? So what kinds of tools do we have? Um, for the particular case of computational crypto, so we are talking about polynomial time and this complexity assumption. We are talking about a classical protocol because it's post-quantum crypto, but we are talking about a quantum adversary. So this is the situation I want to explore. Um, so there are existing tools um, for verification in the computational setting. Let me mention a few well-known of them. There's CertiCrypt, which um, breaks down the proof into very elementary steps, um, verified with the um, General Mathematics Theorem Prover uh, Hook. Then there's EasyCrypt, which is the successor, which lost the ability of breaking it down to this lowest level, however, gains in, in usability a lot. Um, and another one is CryptoVeriv, which is some automated tool that takes a protocol description and automatically does cryptographic rewriting, like replacing something by something indistinguishable in the hope of reaching an, uh, something nice and figuring something out. But I will not talk, take EasyCrypt as an example. And EasyCrypt uses something that is called relational wall logic. And now we can ask the question, might this be already quantum sound? In the sense that if I prove a protocol secure in these tools, this is a post-quantum security proof. And because I couldn't answer this question so easily just in theory, I did a little experiment, a theoretical experiment. Um, namely, I took the CHSH game and just called it a protocol. In a sense, it is a security protocol. It's a protocol with two non-communicating evil people, and we can have a security code that they don't manage to output bit A and bit B so that A or B equals X and Y, the inputs. And most of you probably know this, that classically we cannot have a probability better than three quarters that uh, Alice and Bob win in this protocol, while quantumly um, they can get a bit better. 
And then I went on and I sat down and in easy group proved that the probability that Alice and Bob win this game is at most 0 0.75. And we know that there's a quantum strategy that does it with probability about 0.85. And although this is not really anything, any new insight about CSH8, it shows us that EasyCrypt cannot be trusted if you're talking about quantum reversals, because EasyCrypt just told us something which is wrong in the quantum world. So this show, and we could extend this, for example, uh, this particular approach we could extend into a wrong security proof for some multi-prover proofs or something. So we see that EasyCrypt is unsolved for the quantum case, and this tells us, yep, we need to do new research. How do we, can we improve EasyCube? So, let me tell you a bit about how EasyCube works. Yeah, not much time left for that, but... Um, so now, here it gets a bit too technical to um, give you some impression of how these things work. So, The basic idea of EasyCrypt is a so-called relational whole logic. In the relational whole logic, you take two programs or program fragments, C1 and C2. These could be like two protocol executions, for example. And you want to say that they are somehow related. Yeah, you might want to say, for example, you could say they do the same thing. That's the easiest case. But you need something more complex. So what you can express is if the protocols start or the program fragments start in some state P, and you run both, and, and the P is, is actually, it's not just a state, it's um, something that tells us how their initial states are related. So P could tell, like, if they start in the same state, and we run them, then their states will be related in some other way afterwards. So as an example, we could have for uh, these two program fragments, they're very different. Program fragment one says Z is assigned zero. Program fragment two is, says X is assigned X plus Y. And we know that if initially x1 equals x2, then after running these, then we have x1, so the variable x from this side, which has changed, equals x2 plus y2 because we assigned these things to x. And initially they were um, equal, and from this you can conclude that afterwards this holds. So these kinds of uh, things you expressed. And why do we do that? Sorry? What is this filter? Uh, it's just syntax uh, to separate the two program fragments. Because I can say Yes. Weird. Okay. It, it, I didn't invent the filter there. Uh, the semicolon is already used inside the programs to separate uh, uh, fragments. And it's, I think it's tilde because it's some kind of... It's no, it's, a, it's a, like approximately equal kind of thing, perhaps. Perhaps that's the motivation. I don't know. Okay, so these are the kinds of things um, EasyCrypt does, and then you go step by step, build more complex of these things, and in the end you can, can for example, relate like, the, the, the protocol with the, with the actual key is indistinguishable with the protocol with the random key or something like this. And so this gives you a step by step rewriting of your um, protocol un until you know or you have proven something. That's the basic idea of EasyCrypt. So why does EasyCrypt fail? So we can analyze the, I mean, just the fact that I proved the CHS game says there is a bug somewhere, or something or not quantum so on, but where is it? It comes, it is very subtle. You have to look at the rules very carefully and, and then find out, oh, they are telling us something wrong. And one example is, for example, it has a rule like this. Uh, so this is just for one program written for simplicity, it says if for every x we know that if the adversity state is x, and then we run c, and then we are in, in something that satisfies q, then we know that wherever, in whichever state we start and we run c, then it's q. Seems reasonable, but doesn't make quantum secure, because basically this means that you fix the initial memory of an adversity to something particular, And you, you would essentially end up saying, without loss of generality, we are in place of adversity. Not a good idea. Another one is, what if our expressions have something like variable 1 equals variable 2? Classically, this is kind of very sensible to talk about this. But quantumly, 
So we have, in the one protocol, we have some composite in the other. They may be entangled to other things. And so what does it even mean that they're equal? And all these kind of things are things we need to overcome um, when we go to the um, post-quantum setting with some easy group like this. Um, yeah, I have some ongoing work, and I skip it. Um, but I think it can be done. Uh, I have a logic that is sound, that is not, I haven't proven everything yet, so I can't really promise, but I'll happily tell you details about it offline if you want. Um, but my vision is that once it really works, we have something like, if you can use easy group, if you know how to use easy group, you can also use the quantum easy group, easy group, which, uh, and you just do the same thing, except that some of the steps will not be allowed because they are not quantum safe. And this would solve the problem uh, that a classical cryptographer that will not need quantum knowledge to, to do that, because the tool itself will tell him when he would need a quantum expert. So that is the final situation, and I'm out of, uh, out of time, so thank you for your attention. Any questions? Um, I, I would like to ask if, um, if it's also complete. So if you have, a, I mean, can everything be verified in this queasy crypt? No, even in uh, easy crypt, uh, it is not the case. So it's not that we lose something there. It's just, um, but the thing is that we are trying to mimic general I mean, it, can, it cannot be better than arbitrary pen and paper proofs because they are supposed to only prove things that we can also prove with pen and paper proof. And pen and paper proofs cannot be um, complete either. So, for example, I could make a proof where you, um, a protocol, very artificial, which um, on security parameter X runs a given hard coded Turing machine X steps. And if it holds, the protocol will, for that security parameter, do bad things. And now the protocol is secure if and only if the Turing machine doesn't hold. Um, and that can't be decided. So generally, it will not be uh, complete. But, but, but your, but your queasy, uh, what is it called? Queasy group. Queasy group. Um, will it be, I mean, will it at least be as complete as, as we are? I mean, have you found all the rules? Yeah. That, that I would naturally start as. Uh, um, we can make it that way because basically this logic they are embedded in some ambient logic which is just some general purpose mathematical logic also in easy group. So as soon as you give enough axioms that allow you to, to, to convert from the easy, uh, easy group like from the RHA into an equivalent mathematical statement that doesn't use those and then you do the proof in normal mathematics which the tool also supports and then you go back. So this can be done, so we don't lose anything. Um, we don't even lose something if we throw the whole uh, relation, the whole logic away, and just tell the user just use normal mathematics. So in a sense, this is just a convenience tool. And therefore, it, it will not lose um, completeness. But of course, from, from a practical point of view, it may be that a lot of these things you don't want to do ever. Okay, maybe one last quick question with a quick answer. Not. No <laughs> I have a quick question. Sorry. <laughs> so, do you think that it could be possible to get some sort of compiler, like you go from honest but curious to malicious? You have a compiler that takes any protocol there and transforms it. Like, can you imagine having some compiler with some assumption, OT or you need something yes. that can take a classical secure thing and? Yes. Good. Okay, so let's thank uh, Dominic again.